Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm sitting in uh, or near Orlando, which is where I am based. Uh, Katya is sitting in Munich. Uh, Jess is sitting in near Orlando. Um, and my technical advisor, i.e. my wife, is sitting around the corner from me in case I screw things up. Uh, this is the first AIM Group Deep Dive. Uh, this one is an important one for everybody who's in the recruitment industry. Uh, rebuilding your recruitment marketplace post-pandemic. Uh, some people are still in the thick of the pandemic. Uh, looks like in the U.S. in another month we may be in the thick of it again. Uh, other people have pretty much come out of the pandemic, and certainly for job boards, recruitment marketplaces, um, the pandemic uh, for most seems to be in the past. The hiring that is going on in the U.S. and some other markets is massive. So today we're going to hear from three people, Catherine Minshew of The Muse, I'll tell you about her, Stephen Roth of collegerecruiter.com. We've known him a very long time uh, since he had, and never mind, I won't go, I won't make those uh, hair jokes because I've got, my hair used to be black, then it was light black, now it is getting transparent, so I can't talk about that. Uh, and Matthew Moore of CV Library, which is a very interesting case study and story in the UK. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Peter Zolman. I'm the founder of the AIM Group. We've been doing this for 23, almost 24 years. It blows me away to think of that. We uh, cover marketplaces and um, job boards all around the world. And I'll tell you more about us towards the end, not at the beginning. Katya Riefler, uh, who is in Munich, is really the brains behind both this deep dive and the whole operation, along with Jonathan Turpin. I just come along for the ride. Um, so let me give you quickly today's lineup. We'll have the introduction, which we're in the middle of now. Uh, then Catherine, Stephen, Matthew. Um, I will share a few what I call micro case studies. They're really not case studies at all. Um, questions and answers, you'll text them in and Katya is going to moderate them. We're not gonna do the on-screen kind of thing. Uh, we'll take a quick look at AIM Group Recruitment Intelligence, which is a new product, and then we'll have the giveaway. So you got to stick around almost to the end for the giveaway. Thank you for joining us. Let me tell you that this is based largely on our AIM Group Marketplaces uh, uh, annual, 2021 annual, came out last month, no, two months ago at this point. A post-pandemic recovery, job marketplaces are rebounding. It's 139 pages. It has 17 articles, four data lists, including the top 15 revenue sites in recruitment all around the world, the top 50 recruitment sites all around the world based on traffic, um, and uh, we'll give it away, so stick around. Uh, we're launching two new products today at the AIM Group. One is Deep Dives. You kind of know what they are, free new service from the AIM Group. Um, we'll bring you topics, live events, and podcasts on hot topics. Uh, then we're launching Recruitment Intelligence. And as of 10 minutes ago, it wasn't live, but I'm told it is live now. Talk about getting down to the wire. Um, deep Dives will be quarterly or more often. Uh, we'll bring you great minds. Uh, we hope and think we've done that today. You'll be able to judge at the end of this call whether we were accurate, but I think so. We're going to bring you great topics. Uh, the whole goal is to help you improve your business. Um, this is certainly uh, something that we know something about, and we can help you with that. Uh, we'll use Zoom or a similar platform, try to use things that people are very familiar with. Uh, they'll be based on our special reports. We do four to six a year. And most important, they're free for everyone. Uh, recruitment intelligence. We'll start with a weekly digest. Uh, we've been trialing it for about six or seven weeks. 
Um, we will have an in-depth report twice monthly or even more often. Uh, it's a monthly subscription. You don't have to pay in advance or sign a year contract, anything like that. Uh, and it's uh, under $200 a month. We did that intentionally for budget reasons and also because we think that's a good price point. We'll find out soon enough. Uh, we'll talk more about it later. And let's get started with Catherine. Uh, Catherine had a career at the World Health Organization, the U.S. State Department, McKinsey, and worked in Africa uh, helping people get vaccinated, and that was before the pandemic. Um, she then founded in 2011 the Muse, uh, founder and CEO, and um, the Muse is more a community than it is a traditional job board. We'll let her tell you about it. Um, and she's author of a book called The New Rules of Work. It came out a few years ago. So I suspect, Catherine, that you may have to um, uh, be updating that in another year or two. Is that in the works? We are uh, we are certainly getting interest from the publisher and uh, and others about it. I do think a lot of the a lot of the rules have changed, but um, it is funny. A lot of basic kind of just human to human interaction rules still consistent, whether it's virtual or in person. Well, um, you know, uh, so fill us in on what you have done at the Muse to deal with the pandemic, and more importantly. Um, move forward and and grow again after what I presume was a fairly difficult year. One of our three panelists, by the way, told me that um, to to give away half the secret, uh, his his business thrived during the pandemic, but certainly most job boards, job communities, and recruitment marketplaces did not. So fill us in on how you guys came through and go from there. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, to everyone in the audience, I really appreciate you tuning in. Um, I'm gonna keep my remarks brief today because we obviously have a lot to get to, but um, I, uh, I think you know the last 15 months have been uh, fascinating, unexpected, intense, stressful, like pick your adjective. They've been a lot. And um, we have seen some really interesting things at the Muse. So I'll set the stage by saying, first of all, that previous to uh, the onset of COVID in kind of mid-March of uh, 2020, we were seeing uh, some pretty wild growth. We were up, you know, 90% year over year, uh, sort of full steam ahead. And the pandemic hit us initially, like that kind of screeching sound when you stop a record <laughs> mid through. It was, uh, it was amazing how quickly as the uncertainty and uh, the the kind of fear of the unknown hit the market, we saw companies uh, stop, pull back, freeze hiring. Obviously, this was seen in the market. Interestingly, a lot of um, outsiders to the recruitment industry expected that job seeker traffic soared initially in you know March, April, May 2020 with all of the layoffs, the furloughs, etc. But what we saw for the most part, and, and I'll caveat this by who the muse serves in a minute but what we saw for the most part was those first early intense months of the pandemic job seeker traffic was not necessarily at an all-time high because a lot of people were in shock they were focused on getting themselves and their families through the crisis um and you know they were doing whatever they could and that wasn't necessarily um looking for a new job now part of that was who does the muse serve um we have seven to eight million people a month coming to the muse.com they're mostly uh, millennial and gen z candidates so generally speaking under 35 years old and they're generally looking for full-time positions so we're really good at uh, engineering, sales, marketing, operations, finance, product, uh, data science, that sort of thing. It is um, certainly a um, very, very important segment of the market, but it behaves in some ways quite differently than uh, perhaps the hourly market uh, or service workers, which were off, you know, obviously massively impacted. Um, we, that said, we started to see some really interesting dynamics in the behavior of both 
job seekers and employers kind of throughout the summer into the fall. And I think now obviously is, is a fascinating time. So what are those big things? So first of all, um, and, and actually I'll jump ahead a bit, but um, I think it's no surprise to anyone that we are likely about to enter the best period for recruitment marketplaces in the past 10, 20, possibly even 30 plus years. Why is that? Um, there are a confluence of factors that are driving turnover and I think will continue to drive turnover through the next 18 plus months. Um, it's everything from the shift to remote work and now companies coming back and navigating how to uh, set plans and strategies that will work for the majority of their workforces, newsflash, no company is going to be able to make everyone happy. That's driving a lot of turnover. There are also a lot of individuals, particularly in our segment, which is entry mid-level, who really, uh, you know, there, there's sort of a, a narrative in um, film, in culture, where if people have a near-death experience, they survive a car crash or something, and they kind of wake up with this renewed sense of life. What are my priorities? What do I want, you know, to do with my life? We have collectively as a culture all been through a, um, a version of that near-death experience. And a lot of people are waking up and saying, the career I had, the job I had, the professional situation I had, it is not working for me anymore. And they're looking for something new. So based on the data source, we're seeing anywhere from uh, predictions of 25% um, of employees turning over to upwards of, uh, of 50%. One private group of uh, public company CEOs that I'm very close to is uh, estimating internally that 40% of their entire workforces will change in the next 18 months. So there's a massive amount of change. Uh, people are looking for more flexibility for remote options. But on top of that, I think there's an increasing emphasis on values. And this is something that has been a huge driver of growth here at the Muse um, and that I'm very, very excited to play out. And what does that mean? I think that, um, you know, here in the United States, there was a really massive reckoning around racial justice last summer. And really, I think across a lot of dimensions, um, a, a continuing wake up to the fact that how businesses treat their employees, how they build their workforces is a huge determinant of how happy, successful, productive many employees can be in their roles and at their companies. And so we are seeing this increasing trend of job seekers, again, particularly Gen Z job seekers, millennial job seekers who are saying, I want to work for a business that aligns with my values. Um, I think in the consumer realm, this behavior is well documented. 83% um, of millennials want brands that align with them on values, uh, but we're seeing this move into the employment space as well. And so today on the news, you can search for jobs by um, various benefits like parental leave, tuition reimbursement. We're getting a lot of interest in other types of attributes or values that people are wanting to architect their career around. And I think that is one of the biggest trends for the next one to two years. It's certainly driving a lot of growth here. Um, and, uh, and, and it's been helpful as well because, you know, we've, for those of you that are not familiar with the Muse, when I started the business 10 years ago, the original premise was how do you help people understand what matters to them and then match them with companies jobs uh, and career paths that align with those priorities and with those values. And so we've always allowed companies to showcase their culture, highlight their employees. Obviously during COVID, we moved entirely away from any sort of uh, in-person employee interviews. Now all of the uh, employee interviews on the Muse are done fully remotely. Employees can record answers to questions on their phones or laptops. And so that's a really great source of employee generated content that we didn't have before. Um, but it's been very interesting seeing this renewed interest uh, by a lot of our candidates in being able to research companies before they apply. So I could talk uh, for hours about this, but I know we've had a lot of really great content to get through. So unless there's anything else specific that we didn't cover, um, I, will, uh, I will seed the floor. I'm very excited to hear from my fellow panelists, uh, but really looking forward to, to being here and, and always happy to talk more about particularly the, the kind of candidate engagement um, and what we're seeing drive increasing volume of, uh, of applies on the job seeker side of the spectrum. Thank you. Um, spoken like a true New Yorker. Um, very, very fast, very <laughs> incredible. I could understand because um, because I have New York ears, even though I live in Florida. I'm going to ask you two quick questions before we get to Stephen. Um, you mentioned people can do interviews on phone and I by phone, and I think that's probably um, valuable for our the 
to people who are participating all around the world. Uh, hang on, let me just get rid of this phone call um, because I can't mute the phone in my office. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? And also you blasted through some cultural factors that people can search for on the Muse, like parental leave. And I think those are probably gaining traction in the US faster than they are. The, the search, not necessarily parental leave. I mean, clearly the US is, is the world's laggard when it comes to those things. But can you just run through the factors that can people can search for their job use when they're searching for their job? Because I think that's very relevant to all of the folks on the call. Absolutely. Um, so we've seen, as I, as I mentioned, and I'll try and be slightly slower this time because you're right, when I get excited, I speak a million miles an hour. So we have seen that um, the factors that many job seekers are using to find their next position are not always aligned historically with the factors that recruitment marketplaces have allowed them to search for. And this is really interesting because obviously, um, you know, you can think of it like uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If someone just needs a job for uh, a salary, to pay rent, to cover their basic necessities, sure, they're generally looking for someone who will hire me, you know, at a, at a salary that allows me to live. But when you get into uh, higher up the hierarchy into candidates who um, have more options, who are sought after by employers, especially knowledge workers or digital talent, they're looking for so much more than just the title of a job and the salary it pays. And so on the Muse today, you can search for jobs by um, things like, you know, health care and dental care. Uh, paid holidays, maternity leave, paternity leave, uh, diversity and inclusion programs, um, tuition reimbursement, 401k. Uh, there's a wide variety of factors. We're also looking at what is this next gen of factors that uh, we aren't incorporating today. So you should see some more updates from us later this summer. Um, but, um, you know, I think in, in some countries, by the way, the basics of uh, healthcare, for example, are covered um, through the government, and so it's less of a priority. But for many people in the United States, um, you know, employer provided fully covered healthcare is a priority. Or again, some of these more, um, some of these more aspirational uh, factors, such as uh, tuition reimbursement, you know, maternity and paternity leave. Um, we even have a filter for snacks, although frankly, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, anti because I, I frankly think that that's, uh, to me, I think that's on the trivial side, but um, we heard that some job seekers wanted. We had some companies that were very excited to promote that. Um, so we're playing around with a lot. Luckily, we have an infrastructure at the Muse that allows us to kind of test different filters, see what's picking up traction. We're constantly talking to our job seekers to understand um, where, you know, what are their priorities? Where are we meeting those priorities? Where are we not? So I, does that answer your second question? Um, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, thank you uh, a ton for uh, filling in. I already see we have a few questions for you, but we're going to save them until we, after we hear from Stephen and Matthew. So stick around if you would. And for the rest of you participating, please stick around till the end because we're going to have a giveaway. Uh, but now we're going to hear from Stephen Rothberg. Uh, the bad news is he's an attorney by background. Um, the good news is he saw the light and founded College Recruiter way back in 1991. So think about that. Um, that's very early, very, very early. Um, he was president of the company, company until last year. His, his wife, uh, Faith, is the real boss. Uh, and then he decided that he was no longer good at, well, he said he's not very good at being a boss uh, or managing the myriad things that he needs to do. So he became chief visionary officer, the CVO, which um, is a title that's uh, extraordinary. So speaking of extraordinary, here's Steven Rothberg, a, a good friend for many years. Hey, good, good to talk to you. And, and just, uh, just to clarify a couple things. Um, so I like to say that, um, yeah, I am an attorney by education, but fully recovered. 
Um, people who know me well would disagree with the fully recovered part. Um, it's, it's more like a 12 step program. Um, and you're um, on step four? <laughs> uh, maybe three and a half. <laughs> so, um, Peter, do you want me to tell to tell the listeners like a little bit about College Recruiter and what our experience was? Sure. So, um, you know, at a very high level, we believe that every student and recent graduate deserves a great career. Um, so, the users of our site, the candidates who use it, um, overwhelmingly are currently enrolled students and what we call recent graduates, those who graduated within the last three years of um, all one year, two year and four year colleges and universities. Um, until about a month ago, um, we only accepted postings for jobs located in the US and Canada. About a month ago, we, we started to accept them mostly based on, on customer requests um, overseas. And, and in some countries like the UK, for example, we're seeing growth of um, traffic 50% week over week over week from a fairly small base, but it's not that we're doing anything different in terms of marketing. Um, it's that we now have content, job content um, that's of interest to them. Um, I, I loved what, what Catherine said, um, um, how she said it too with the passion. Don't, don't, don't ever apologize for that. Um, but the, um, in terms of, you know, when COVID hit, um, sort of how the, um, our business and those of most in our industry really changed uh, kind of overnight. Um, our, our company saw it coming a little bit earlier because we had a relative in the UK who actually was positive at the end of January um, and then exposed um, our daughter who never got COVID um, right at the beginning of February. So a lot of people in the US didn't really wake up and sort of see that COVID was a thing or really something to be concerned about until maybe March 6th, 7th, 8th. Um, but for us, we, un, you know, unfortunately, in some ways, we had about a month and a half of, of time before that um, to prepare. Um, our business, as you alluded to, was way up um, last year. Um, our, our revenues have been growing at about 50% a year, and um, we actually kind of blew away what our revenue and profitability growths were last year um, in some ways because of COVID. Not that COVID in, in any way is a good thing, but, but there were um, some organizations that were less impacted by it negatively and some that were, um, had some positives. So we were, we were in that positive group. Um, there were a few reasons. Um, first of all, um, one of the things that I think is, is, is almost hard to remember is that back in kind of the April, May time period um, in the US and, and also globally, there were a lot of governmental programs that were designed to um, rescue, to keep alive a lot of small businesses. Um, we were a beneficiary of that. Um, and that was very critical. So there was a program in the US called the Paytech, Paycheck Protection Program. And basically what it did is for small businesses, um, we got the equivalent of about eight weeks worth of payroll. Um, and it was free money. As long as you kept your employees on and didn't go through layoffs, um, then that money was forgiven. Um, so we didn't have any layoffs at all um, as, as a result of, of uh, COVID or the economic conditions. And the PPP program was, was really critical to that. Um, because of that, um, we were able to not just stay alive, but we were also able to thrive. We were fortunate because several years before, um, and my wife, as you said, Peter, who's, a, who's been our CEO for, I think, 10, 12 years, maybe 13 years now, um, she and I spoke at a conference that you guys hosted a couple of years ago in Barcelona, and we talked then about how we had transitioned almost all of our customers, our employer customers, from traditional duration-based um, advertising, you know, $75, $200, whatever for a 30-day ad um, to um, programmatic um, and or uh, performance-based. They're two different things. They're often used together. But now almost all of our job posting customers um, pays post programmatically. Um, so we get feeds. They don't come to our site and manually post a job 
or pull out a credit card and post with rare exceptions. The very smallest ones do. Um, and almost all of them are also paying on a cost per click basis. And almost all of them are on um, what we call a subscription uh, model. So their contracts with us renew month after month after month after month until they tell us to stop. So one of the things that happened during COVID was that a lot of job boards um, re rely on employers coming to their site to manually post jobs, to log into an account and then to post a job. And the problem with that during COVID was that almost overnight, about a third of recruiters were laid off. So the recruiters who were posting those jobs were often the same recruiters who were laid off. Um, and even if they weren't laid off, if you're a senior vice president of talent acquisition and you have a contract and it's automated and you're getting the candidate flow you need, you're probably not going to take the time out to go and manually log into a site and, and post jobs, especially if you're kind of undergoing layoffs. Um, so that, that kind of um, saved our bacon. Um, another thing that really helped us a lot is that the, um, the bulk of our customers, um, our employers, our Fortune 1000 companies, government agencies, um, and other employers that hire at scale, those were the organizations generally that did the best during COVID. Those were, you know, the, the Amazons of the world, FedEx, U, um, UPS, um, some, some retailers, um, healthcare companies, et cetera, that, that hire um, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of people. And when the economy really shifted from all of us going, you know, walking into a shop to ordering online, um, when telemedicine became much more prevalent. So instead of walking into a doctor's office, now you're connecting virtually. Um, those organizations needed to really staff up um, or really transform their hiring. Um, and we were definitely a beneficiary of that. Um, thanks, Stephen. Uh, it's, it's amazing that you and I personally uh, were beneficiaries of the PPP and it actually a government program that actually worked. Um, it's so unusual in the United States to have one of those. Um, but uh, it, it, it helped keep the economy going and certainly your change during the past few years of switching from you know duration based postings to programmatic and TFN uh, on, you know, ongoing posts and ongoing slots and so forth has made a big difference for you and for other uh, recruitment uh, sites. And as they go forward, more and more will be less and less about the individual commodity postings. Um, so we're going to talk to somebody uh, who generated a lot of interest in our uh, publication about a month ago, by the way. We uh, hope you'll all stick around to the end because we're going to have a giveaway uh, and we're going to do Q&A after uh, a few minutes. So send those questions and answers by text, uh, send them in, and you'll be able to ask Catherine, Stephen, uh, Matthew, uh, or me, although I have no idea why you, why you want to ask me, ask the experts, right? Um, Matthew is a numbers guy. He's a chartered accountant. He's based outside London. He's not in London, although he told me he got back into London last week. He's finance, he became finance director at CV Library in 2013. Uh, and he became uh, MD in September 19th, just about four months before everything uh, went started going to... Um, uh, going crazy. So that I would say is probably what you would call perfect timing, uh, or or maybe you would call it not perfect timing. Uh, and so now let's hear from Matthew. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Oh, well, look, I think I had the, the benefit of being with the company for seven years before before taking or sorry when the pandemic came along and it put me in good stead. But yeah, I'll start by just talking about some of our experiences of what we saw you know, immediately at the start of the pandemic. Look, as Stephen talks about the different types of job posting, we're, we're heavily duration based or we have been historically. And what that meant is our revenue nearly halved overnight. So going back to last April, 
particularly tough period in, in the UK. And you mentioned earlier the furlough scheme, the government retention scheme. We were, we were trying to get our heads around that, understand that, see if we could use that and, and buy time actually to make to make the right decisions. And we did. And it was a, it was a great thing for us that it bought some very good people time that we didn't really have to look at. Um, for us, you know, the, the volume of incoming calls that we had at the start, you know, late March, April was, you know, it, it was all negative. It was about people that wanted to pause their accounts, get money back on their contracts, um, actually ask for refunds on money they'd already given us. It was, it was incredibly challenging time. Um, also internally, we, you know, we weren't set up to work from home. We were quite a traditional business in terms of the, the few hundred people that are based in these offices in fleet would, you know, probably only about 10, 15% were set up to work from home or work, work properly remotely. So look, we had some huge challenges, but also actually on the flip side of that, we're incredibly lucky in, in some ways that we're in an industry that could still operate. We weren't, we weren't shut completely. Um, as a generalist job board, we went across you know, multiple sectors. So, you know, if we're focused on aviation or hospitality in, in industries that came to a complete standstill, we, we weren't. We had the opportunity to focus on, you know, someone touched on distribution, IT, pharmaceutical, medical. So we, we could focus our areas in, in parts of the economy that, that were still growing. And with all that data we had as well, there was also that PR opportunity around, you know, talking about the job market as a whole and some of the insight that we could give. We really used to push our own name and get it out there. Now, what, how did we deal with all of these things? I think we, we look back and you know, we've been going for 20 years. So and we look back at a, the previous recession. The CV Library was a much smaller company coming out of the global financial crisis, 2007, 2008. But actually, it was the way we came out of that that meant we grabbed market share. At that point, we really focused on the delivery for our customers. So, you know, the, the CVs that we could provide, the applications to our site, to the jobs on our site and the traffic. And we also looked at flexibility at that time. Whilst the, at the competition would also be rigid at times and, you know, the approach they take with our customers, we thought that's, that's not the way to go. So, you know, when we were having the hundreds of calls a day for customers, you know, wanting not to use our service anymore, we, we tried to approach that in a flexible manner, not take the hard line that you've signed up for a 12-month contract and there's, there's no movement on that. Recruiters, direct employers have a long memory. Um, and if you, if you treat them badly or treat them badly at the start of the pandemic, we believe that that would come back and haunt you when the markets came back. And that we've talked about briefly about how robust actually the job market's been and some of that job seeker activity. And we, we were prepared to take the long game in terms of with our customers, support them while it was hard, support them while they perhaps had half the number of users on our site not be ridiculous about what we demanded and, and just keep them on as customers. And what we've seen is that that market's gradually recovered is that, you know, that loyalty has been paid back to us. Um, so we also had that focus on innovation as well. You know, whilst you've got the time that perhaps, you know, there wasn't as many external events, customers to deal with, we invested in our product and tech team as well. Um, and something that someone else touched on earlier, you know, we, we launched video interviewing on our site that you could, you could do it directly on our site. We looked at different screening questions, different things that we could bring in that really helped the recruiters who used our site get the most from it. We looked at assisted machine learning to make sure we got the best from the searches that went on in our site and that real focus internally. But it came back to making sure that we delivered more registrations on our site. So that, that 16 million database that we've got of CVs, we're continuing to grow that, Dr looking at driving application numbers, reducing unsubscribes, but ultimately making sure that that client satisfaction was still there. Yes, their demand for what they needed from our site was lower, but making sure that, that they were as equally as happy with our site as they were Know, a year ago, six months ago, whatever the time frame might be, and really focus on that satisfaction. Internally, we had, like I say, a number of challenges. You know, we invested in a lot of tools that we that we needed to, and I think it's really helped modernize us as a business. So, whether it be Microsoft Teams or other sort of tech software around something like called New Relic, where we how we monitor our site. You know, recently invested in some a cloud cloud based telephone system. You know, that means that that hybrid working can happen easier. That report clear reporting that meant you know we are going to be a hybrid business in terms of how we work from the office and at home going forward and making sure we've got the tools to do that and as Catherine said you know it's the, the, the market's changed massively and how we look to recruit has changed for ourselves as well as the you know the look at that wider market those questions of what matters to people you know we've taken people on in locations we would have never dreamed of previously and look, we've, we've tried to embrace that also you know I say we were very much based in the office we've looked about how we communicate with our own our own staff team um, and being more transparent so in that that first period you know late March April May 
we told everyone what we needed to break even each day in terms of the revenue that come in and we'd send that out of uh, that position of where we were at so there was that complete transparency that if we were making tough decisions it was because that you know revenue was half what it used to be or we weren't we weren't where we should be and that, that was something that we could stop quite quite quickly because the position improved but what we did do was make sure we carried on that communication so once we could see the market recovering and the investment in our own innovation really paying dividends we talked about well when are we going to get back to the account numbers and the growth that we we had pre-pandemic so we laid that out to the business and then on a weekly we'd update the whole company of the progress that we were making in terms of getting accounts and I'm, I'm delighted to say that, you know, we're, we're sort of 10% above where we were pre-pandemic in the number of users and accounts we have on our site. I think we still have an issue about the yield that we're getting. There's still, you know, there's, there's a little bit of risk out there that people aren't willing to commit huge budgets, not to us anyway at this stage. But we'll carry on with believing that if people are getting good value from our site, when that when that comes back and that little confidence continues to grow, that they'll put more budget towards CV Library because we're delivering more from them. No, I'm, I'm really excited about what the few, the next year, two years for CV Library. The, say the job market itself has held up particularly well. I look at the recent announcement in the UK to delay some of the the further opening that's been pushed back to the 19th of July. That had a very small impact. I mean, I look at job posting numbers; they dip by one or two percent. So very small. So I'm really excited about the future, the, the foundation that we've you know, we've made over the last year or so, and keeping our customers happy. And we'll carry on looking at it that way. And like I say, I really see a, a positive market looking forward. Um, that's terrific. Thank you very much. I'm glad you're uh, at above your pre-pandemic numbers. I think that's great. Um, you know, this has been, without a doubt, the craziest year in any of our lives, unless unless we lived through World War II. Uh, none of us, uh, none of us on the panel, at least, have uh, lived lived through World War II. Um, that was very crazy, uh, to be sure, and very difficult. But this has been a very difficult year, and we're glad that everybody has come through as well as they have. I am now going to remind you, this was based largely, there are articles about these companies in our annual report. If you stick around till the end, uh, you'll, we'll have a giveaway for, um, uh, we'll have a giveaway for it. Uh, I'm going to do four micro case studies. They're really not even case studies and touch on for 20 seconds, 30 seconds each, three companies to watch uh, that were profiled in the report. Uh, and then we'll talk for five minutes about what else we're doing and we'll get to your Q&A shortly. Um, this is DPG Media Group. It used to be known as De Pairs Group. Uh, it's based in Antwerp. Uh, they run job boards in Belgium and the Netherlands. They're doing something very interesting. The jury is definitely still out on this. They're running a programmatic network alongside traditional recruitment advertising paper, post paper, duration, and so forth. They didn't want to work with Indeed, so they built their own, and they're combining paper for duration with their own pro programmatic um, network. And um, it's safe to say, because they say it themselves, that the jury is still out, but it is a very interesting uh, experiment because they're trying to maintain their their old way of doing business while at the same time moving into a, a definite new way of doing business that competes with the old way. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with DPG. Um, Facebook and LinkedIn, two companies you definitely need to keep an eye on. Uh, both sites are planning gig products. The launches are expected this year, but neither company is being very open or transparent about them. Uh, the freelance sites, Fiverr, Upwork, uh, Gig Work, Elance, you know, all the Elance is now part of Fiverr. Um, all of those kind of gig sites are going to be challenged by this, but full service sites, many of whom have gotten into gig work and remote work listings are also going to be challenged. A uh, LinkedIn product executive um, said in a in a web post that they are working around the clock on their gig product. So keep an eye on them. Uh, and at the same time, 
you got to be thinking about what you offer or should be offering or will be offering for gigs because the gig economy is definitely not going away anytime soon. Um, PNET, how'd you like to work in a, in a country where unemployment is 32%? Um, PNET was a um, successful, or relatively small by some standards, uh, job board in South Africa. Uh, they lost a lot of their agency spend. So they increased their focus on small and medium enterprises. They started, of course, using remote sales more. They said they retained 90% of their corporate clients, which is remarkable in uh, South Africa. And they may, met 86% of their 2020 budget target uh, and are recovering from there. So that's a very strong, uh, interesting recovery in a market that's been very challenged by the pandemic. And finally, we go to one of the global uh, leaders, massive company in the world of recruitment advertising. Uh, Seek is the Australia recruiting giant. Australia, New Zealand are giant for them. They also are very heavily involved in the education market. Uh, they're stepping up their investment in Southeast Asia, where they own Job Street and Jobs DB. They reduced their exposure in China. They cut their stake in Xiaopin uh, to 23.5% from a minority, from a majority ownership. They sold their shares for 550 million US, which is probably about 750 million Australia, which gave them a nice cushion. And they also own sites in Latin America that are, um, it's safe to say they're very challenged. One's in Brazil, has an unusual business model called Catho, uh, where the job seekers pay. And one is in um, Mexico. So Seek is, uh, Seek is undergoing some changes too. Uh, and the CEO changed, the founder, uh, Andrew Bassett is, uh, stepping down as CEO or has stepped down, I'm not sure. So those are the four big ones that we took an extensive look at in uh, our annual edition. We also looked at Adzuna. Uh, Adzuna is a company some of you may be familiar with. They're an aggregator operating in 16 countries with more than 10 million monthly visits. Uh, they're still uh, they're relying on cost per click revenue, and they have tens of millions of pounds in annual revenue, or more specific than that. Uh, Goopy, very interesting. It's goopy.io. I should have put the URL here. I'm sorry. Goopy.io. It's an applicant tra tracking system based in Brazil. Um, it doesn't compete directly with Brazil's top three job boards. It's lower than info jobs and Vagas and traffic, but higher than Indeed. Um, and it's a smart AI matching system. They don't have a job board or job listings, but we found them fascinating and worth keeping an eye on. So that's goopy.io or goopy, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. And Hello Work, it's a recruitment tech company based in France. They operate a network of job boards, including regions job, probably 15 or 20 niche job boards. Uh, they are actively acquiring various recruitment tech companies. And they said their monthly average in 2020 was 2 million applications and 4 million users every month. So even in the pandemic, they were getting applications that they were passing on to employers and 4 million users a month. Uh, you can win a free copy of the report or subscribe to AIM Group Recruitment Intelligence. I'll tell you about that in a second and get one that way. If 
here we go. So recruitment intelligence is a new product we literally launched about 9.55 my time today. We've been working on it for six months. We've been trialing it for two months, but we got it out the door today. Stephen Rothberg told us yesterday, sign me up. So he became our second subscriber. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, it includes several elements, a weekly recruitment intelligent digest, an in-depth report twice monthly or more often sometimes, monthly subscription, you don't have a long-term commitment, it's under 200 bucks a month, uh, you sign up with a credit card at our website. This is what the digest looks like. We have news of note, this week it was China-based 51 job to go private in a $5.7 billion deal, uh, a data leak at Paul Empoire in France, a uh, big court ruling or a court action involving LinkedIn and some other things. Um, we also have the in-depth article. This week's was about employer reviews. Uh, are they a hassle or are they integ integral to your service? Um, Weekly editors picks things from around the web and people on the move. So when Matthew uh, Moore becomes chair and CEO of uh, CV Library, um, uh, di displacing Lee, we'll put that right in uh, Weekly Digest. Don't tell Lee I said that, please. Um, we also have information about our events. Uh, AIM Group Deep Dive event was promoted in there and some of you may have signed up from, uh, from it. Um, you will go to our website to sign up. Recruitment news and analysis you won't find anywhere else. This is what the sign up page looks like. And if you sign up for six months, you will um, receive as a bonus our recruitment annual, which is ordinarily $1,500. So you do a six month commitment at $1,200 and you get the recruitment annual as part of that. We hope you will all sign up end of sales pitch. Um, we have a world-class conference um, for recruitment sites called RecBuzz, and our great news is we'll be back in person, barring the unforeseen, and we all hope there is no unforeseen, next March in Barcelona. Hope to see every one of you there, and we're very much looking forward to getting back to in person. We looked at October, but things were just too uncertain. Um, so about the AIM Group, we're a global business intelligence, news, analysis, conferences, and consulting. The consulting is something most of you don't see, but we do a lot of that, help recruitment uh, marketplaces understand their com competition, understand their skill sets, understand what they need to know focus on marketplaces and classified advertising. We work at senior levels generally, uh, and we have 30 plus analysts around the globe. Um, this is me, there's Katya, and Jonathan has been silent today. That's because I, any chance I get to use the mute button on my boss, I do it. So Jonathan may or may not be lurking, but I have muted him happily. Um, this is our team. Uh, it's kind of grown over the past few years, uh, and I just sometimes it amazes me. Um, we have, we do payroll in rupiah, lira, Australian dollars, UK pounds, Russian rubles, euros, and US dollars, and more. So you can see we're fairly global. Um, it's your turn in just a moment. But first, most importantly, I got to thank Catherine Minshew, Stephen Rothberg, Matthew Moore, Katya Riefler, uh, Riefler, Shilpa, Ellen, and Jess, who were behind the scenes putting everything together. Uh, the, they are the most important people putting this stuff together. They just prop me up. I'm kind of, I'm kind of a, um, they prop me up. So uh, most of all to you. Let's get to the giveaway. Jess, why don't you pick a num number from one to 80 and pick that, find that name in the participants and we will uh, send him or her 
the uh, the report, um, and we'll send out a note telling people about the report um, and who the winner was. Um, it's your turn, Q and A. That means I have to go to the participants and unmute Katya um, and unmute whomever. Come on, Katya, unmute. Hello, everybody. Hi, how are you? Um, yes, we have quite some questions, and uh, it's it's uh, perhaps uh, just just to start with um, a question uh, from Raphael Bonelli um, from Matthew. How do you achieve the one-on-one -on -one customer service ratio reported by AIM? In terms of our customer service, it's uh, look we. We've always had as many people in customer service as we have had in, in sales, and we've placed a high high importance on that. And I think the reason it, it works for us is actually what it what it generates is that really high renewal rates on accounts. Um, so it actually ends up paying for itself. I believe it, you know, whilst we're, in many ways, we're a tech-enabled business, the people in, the, in our customer service team, it's not... Uh, it's not a complaint center where you're waiting to, you know, for someone to come out, ring up and say, I'm not getting enough response on my, from my job advert for my, can't find the right candidates. It's, it's a proactive team that's making sure anyone who uses our service gets the most from it. Therefore, I, I really see it as whilst they don't have a revenue target themselves, what they generate for us in terms of that customer service and what it gives us is, is, is huge. Yeah. That's, um, we have a more general question uh, when it comes to uh, LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and what, what are you all doing to, uh, to prevent them from stealing your business? Who wants to start? Catherine? Catherine. Uh, I'm just laughing because I, I think it's a it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, we, we're a bit different in that um, all of the seven to eight million job seekers who come to the Muse are organic. So people are sort of finding us directly because they're looking for either the values-based career search, the company profiles and research, or the, the job search advice. Um, so, you know, I, I do find uh, the rise of the kind of monopoly tech platforms to be disturbing in a general sense. Um, but I, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm as specifically worried um, about their impact on the business. I do think, you know, Google jobs is a really interesting one because we were hit in 2019 with uh, a penalty that we didn't understand, which brought traffic from Google jobs to zero overnight. Um, and it took us some time to figure out what the problem was and remedy it partially because it's very difficult to get, you know, on the phone or even in, in contact with anyone there. So um, I hope that uh, that Google continues to invest in customer service if they're going to be such a big part of the job search and recruitment marketplace. But um, I don't know, you know, every every couple of years, one of the massive tech companies makes a move into job search. Google did it a few years ago. It's generally followed by a series of articles, especially in Silicon Valley, about how recruitment Based businesses are doomed, um, and and it generally never seems to work quite as well as people um, as people are are you know on the inside of these big companies are hoping, and usually they pull back or they allocate the resources elsewhere. So, I, I do think that their stranglehold on the advertising market is very problematic. Although, again, since we're not using that at scale, it's it's less directly relevant for us. But um, I don't know if anyone else wants to to chime in. I just um, yeah, I do think it's a big societal problem, and I, uh, I hope somebody at a higher pay grade than me is is focused on finding an answer. Um, I'll tell you that in the recruitment annual, we had deep dive articles into Google for Jobs, which is not Google Jobs and not, but the specific Google for Jobs product, and also into Facebook for Jobs, uh, and our recruitment analyst John Zapp essentially said Facebook doesn't seem to be focused on jobs and so it's it's less of a threat. Google does not seem to be focused extensively on Google for jobs, but if they do, uh, they could be a uh, 
significant threat. Let's take two more questions. We may run a minute or two over. Let's take two more questions, and then I'll wrap up with the last three or four um, uh, three or four slides, and I'll ask Jess to announce who the winner is. Um, so Jess, be ready. Um, Katya, go go with the question. If you I, would. I would, would love to do, but my question, my Q&A screen disappeared. Would you mind just opening it and have a I look at will, yourself? <laughs> I will. Raphael said, that was awesome, awesome, referring to Catherine. Love the New York energy. So you went fast, but not too, um, not too fast for some people. John Salt, who is a terrific, terrific guy, I'm sure, I'm sure you know him, Matthew. Um, John Salt, a great guy in the UK recruitment, said, with the rise in CPC and the fall in response to jobs. Is this revenue model under pressure? Great question. Thank you for participating, John, by the way. Um, we'll talk later, I hope. Uh, anybody want to tackle that? Catherine, you want to tackle tackle that? Or Stephen? I think, Stephen, you certainly have a good, good view on that. Yeah, I, 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 I can speak to that. Um, he's right that there has been um, upward pressure on, on cost per click. Um, in, in most markets um, and most uh, sectors, but not, not in all. Um, upward pressure on cost per click in some ways is due to the pandemic. Um, for example, last year, um, it was very common to see warehouse jobs uh, for Amazon, FedEx, et cetera, um, with much higher CPCs than they had been before. It's a fairly small number of people who were, um, who were ready, willing, and able to do that work. And there was a massive um, demand by employers. Um, at the end of the day, what I've heard from employers um, for the 25 or so years that we've been doing this since, since 96, over and over and over again, is that there is not a single service out there, um, whether it's CV Library, The Muse, College Recruiter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. Not a single one of our services are expensive if it works. Um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter how cheap we are, it's too expensive. So I push back on the idea that costs per click are too, too high. If those clicks are leading to applications and leading to interviews and leading to hires, then that is incredibly cheap. So I think it's actually more a problem of are those clicks converting into applications? And um, in some of the markets um, where vaccinations are more common, like the US, UK, Canada, Israel, what we're seeing is um, a, a real inversion in the labor market. Um, far more companies are hiring than candidates are applying. But I strongly disagree with anybody who would say that there aren't enough candidates or that there aren't enough people looking for work. Um, I think what it is is that candidates have gotten smart and they have realized that for the next stage in their life, they deserve to make a decent living and they deserve to be treated properly. And the employers that are, that are struggling the most to hire people have gotten mostly, um, they've gotten away for decades with treating candidates like crap and paying them like crap um, and right now, what they're realizing is that they can either treat them like crap or pay them like crap, but they can't do both. Um, and uh, so I think what, as employers are more transparent about their compensation and as they better communicate to candidates how they, how they treat them, what they've done well, what they haven't done well, and the Muse has tons of great content on that, um, those are going to be the employers that are going to win. Sounds good. I've got one last question, then I got about four more slides, and we'll ask Jess who the winner is. Um, and um, uh, anonymous attendee, uh, who's we have a lot of anonymous attendee questions. Uh, Matthew, what were your biggest cost saving successes? Which ones are you still using? And I'll add the second half of that, which is, and which ones do you plan to maintain indefinitely? 
I, I wouldn't want to you know talk about how we've come out of this really based on cost cutting so it's about our investment in the, the tech and the product team and the focus on innov innovation what i would say to anyone it's you know yeah, look, we, we had to make cuts. We, we did. And like I said at the start, when our revenues halved, um, it was necessary. And we, we used the, the furlough scheme and a uh, number of areas of support. And what I would say is that for any business, if you, you know, if you need to save 10%, you don't just save 10% across the board. You look at what you're using, what you need and, you know, in the areas where you, where you just don't need it. And every business does have that. Sometimes you think you're as lean as you can or should be, but it's really about having a real deep dive into those specific areas because there's some areas that you'll need to invest more in. If I took, if I look at you know the things I said earlier, we've invested in a new telephone system, we've invested in Teams, we've invested in the tech platform as a whole. But I think it was just a, a real look and a real honest view of where we were performing and where we weren't internally. Spoken by uh, spoken like a true numbers guy. Okay, on that note, thanks again to Catherine, Stephen, Matthew. Katya, Shilpa, Ellen, and Jess. Jess, can you chime in with the uh, winner? Do I have to turn your uh, audio on? Let's see. Go to participants. There's Jess. Unmute. I don't have to unmute you. Can you ch chime in with the uh, winner of the uh, yes. annual? Yes, it was uh, David Beau Repair. Oh, David. Um, if David already bought it, uh, we'll find another winner. Um, I think he may have. If not, uh, David, you'll get it in the email in, in 15, 20 minutes. Uh, most of all, thanks to all of you for not only participating, but sticking around. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay well. And uh, we wrap up a minute late. Not bad at all. I think this was terrific. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate the behind the scenes work as well. Take care, everybody.